All right, there we go. What's up, everybody? I'm Sal Kalani. This is Reggie Steele. And welcome to Spitballing. We back, bro. We back. We back. We back. We, we, back. Back. we got yeah, we back, back to back, back guests. Yes. Back yes. to back yes. guests. This I'm week. excited about today's guest, too. Today, we're going to get right into it. Um, he's pretty much almost in the lobby waiting to come in. Yeah. <laughs> um, we're really excited about this guest because he's, he's got a short time period. So we're going to have to keep it tight and succinct. And uh, succinct, see how it goes, is that man. a word? Like, it is a, it is a word. S-U-C-C-I-N-C-T, I think, succinct. Um, all right yes all right well you want to introduce him while i while i'll admit him to the room okay um so today's guest is a a friend of ours that goes way back um he's a good friend of ours uh he's a comedian he's a a writer he's an actor uh he's he's had a number of big accomplishments he's a two-time emmy award winner and uh we're excited to have him on the show today so without further ado let's welcome (laughs) to the show kevin avery all right he's cavery cavery that's a good one cavery i call him cavery that's a hell of a headshot there he is there he is all right i don't know why that picture was just uh, yeah it's looking good Uh, no look i love the hair bro love the hair man i'm just can i get some what the hell i know you ain't seen me what i had to there you go i've never (laughs) i first of all are we recording already we are are you, do you already have wine? Are you already got a glass of wine? This I, early? No wine. Okay. Um, I did think of pouring a glass of tequila. Wow. <laughs> just <for laughs> just want to get the day started right. I mean, that's just nine. That's, that's what you got to do, right? It's already 9 a.m. Why wouldn't you? You know, exactly. So. It's, it's 5 p.m. somewhere, right? Probably not, not, though. I don't it think. Not. I don't think so. I don't think, I don't think, I don't think time works that way. So. No, no. So. so how are you, Kevin? I'm good. Um, good to see you, man. It's it's a it's been a hectic week. I mean, I'm on a deadline, so that's you know. Oh, okay. Uh, are you like nervous? Oh. Are you are you on edge when you're on a deadline? I feel like I should be more stressed out right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm also used to doing this. Um, I've been on this this show. It's a uh, writing. An ep- my episode for the Great North, um, which is a show I write uh, on Fox on uh, Sunday nights at eight thirty, and uh, it's an animated show. And so I've done this is my third. We're on season three. We're writing season three right now. So I, I have a you know I've done a handful of episodes. So I'm fairly used to how it how it works. Well, remember the last time when I saw you in San Francisco right like mm-hmm. toward the end of right actually i think it was the end of 19 the end of 19 going into 20 where you were kind of yeah. stressing about writing your episode for that season yes that yeah. was my first time and i yeah, i was like i was it's weird because they're you know they're not your characters to start right. and and it you know it was like my first time doing this writing on a scripted show and so, yeah, I was like, I don't know how I'm going to pull this off. I don't know how I'm going to do it. Well, remember you, oh, you did. I remember, I remember you coming back. I remember talking to you and you were like, yo, I wrote like, I forget what it was. You said I wrote like 50 something pages for your episode and it had to be like 23. No, it, 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 we, we have a weird thing where like, it's a half hour show, but the right. way the script is structured, the pages come out to like 50-ish, 50 something, 55 pages. Um, that's the length that they should be. I had written 86. Oh, that's what it was. <laughs> and I had, and I had, I write long and, um, I write slow and I write long. And, uh, and so I had to cut like, you know, 20 pages or, or I knew I needed to, to just to turn it in back then I had to get it down to like 60 something pages. And then the rest we could we could figure out. And I yeah, I was like, I gotta cut twenty pages in two days. Oh man, and it's your it's your work, right? So it's hard to cut, I imagine, right? Like every you well, can put it all or okay. I mean, you know the I mean the the it's you learn very early on that's how you know the expression is kill your darlings. That's the, that's the classic writer <laughs> phrase, and you know it's just I learned very quickly when I first started in television that you just have to cut 
what is necessary to cut. And you can't, be, nothing can be precious. Right. And um, whether it's whether it's your writing work or whether it's you on screen or if it's got to go, it's got to go. And that's just that's just how it works. Right. You can't you be married to any of it. Right. You hey, can't have your feelings. Yeah, your feelings. All right. Well, yeah. I want to ask you when when you get this job for the the Great North, and then they assign they go, hey, you have an episode coming up, and then you're like, okay, I have to write my first episode ever. Right. Oh well, like, I mean, so how far into the season do you get to do that? Are you and do they give you a fuck? direction, or you just, or you just kind of know where you know where that you know where the show is headed? Like you know the characters. You already know. I mean, they had three episodes already written, so there was the pilot that they all wrote together, and then at the time that I started, there were three showrunners. Um, one was a team, uh, Wendy and Lizzie Molino from. They used to write on Bob's Burgers, and they yes. were they were writing team two sisters and so they so there was the pilot that they all three of them wrote together then wendy and lizzie's episode and then uh minty lewis was the third show runner and she wrote another episode and i think all three of those episodes were done by the time we started or at least two and so we had an idea of what the show looked like or felt like um, and you know, there's all, there's lots of talk about it and stuff, but what essentially happens is you start coming up with episode ideas to pitch to them. And okay. I went into a, my first meeting with them with like my first pitch meeting with them with like 11 ideas or something. And some of them are more fleshed out than others. Some of them are just like, what if, you know, uh, Judy uh, buys a, a falcon or whatever, <laughs> um, and 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 then they they take what they want from there. On my episode, they had a I pitched a an idea that there was like I had just gone to Comic Con, <laughs> so I pitched this idea <laughs> that they that the this is a, a show about a family that lives in Alaska, a single dad raising three kids, and then he's got like an adult son who's married to this woman who has moved to Alaska from uh, uh, Louisiana, right? Fresno, actually. Fresno, oh, that's right. And, Fresno. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, I thought it was somewhere in the South, but it was like- Close. No, no, no. <laughs> Central and so, um, and so, and you know, the dad is is Nick Offerman, the kids are like uh, um, uh, Will Forte and, and, um, I'm forget and Jenny Slate and Aparna Nancherla and, um, Paul Rust, it's a great, really fun cast. Um, uh, Alanis Morissette is, is, is on the show. Uh, oh, she yeah. plays, she's um, the first, she the first plays, episode. She's the, the lady in the sky, right? Yeah. Yeah. She plays <laughs> Judy's imaginary friend and she appears in the Northern Lights in Alaska. Um, Dulce Sloan is in it. She plays, uh, Honeybee who has moved up from Fresno and marries, uh, uh, Will Forte's character. Um, so it's really fun cast. And so you have a lot of very funny people to play with when you come up with these, these ideas. So yeah, I, I went to them with the different ideas. Oh, and I had just gone to Comic-Con and I pitched this idea where the dad, Beef, and uh, Wolf, the oldest son, go to this Comic-Con-like convention in Lone Moose, Alaska uh, called WoodCon. And they meet their, like, their idol this, this sort of celebrity, this wilderness celebrity named Tusk Johnson. And so what they did is they were like, we like this idea of them meeting their, their hero. Forget the whole WoodCon thing. I ju we just, we just, we want, we like the idea of, of Wolf and Beef meeting their hero, go. And I had to just create something from that and throughout all the rest of the, and there was a whole other, thing that I had with that story. And, and so I had to throw all that out and just start with this one kernel. Um, and That's like starting like, over. Almost, yeah. I mean, it was like, okay, what do I, you know, but that's, that's, that's the job that's, you know, and then sometimes they'll take just about everything you have and they go, oh, we love all this, go write it. And then it'll change and evolve over time. Right. So, um, yeah, you you just kind of and and as you shake the idea, you put together like a one sheet for it, you know, a summary 
for the episode and then the next phase is outlining it once the network and the studio and the the eps approve the idea then okay outline it and then it has to go through that process all over again and then all right go off and write your script um and then you have you know however much time you have to write yeah how long literally... is that whole process well the whole process is like i feel like a couple of months two three months sometimes depending wow. on when in the lineup you are writing your script Okay, and that's that's for one episode. That is one episode. That's for writing one episode. For writing and one then episode. After that, you have to, it goes through all these rewrite processes, and and I mean you are rewriting things. So we are now. We just started our second season. We just aired the second episode of season two this past Sunday. Um, I'm my episode is the seventh. And I have been rewriting stuff like up till I don't know a couple of weeks ago. Oh wow. Uh, wow! It's just it's animation, so it just it evolves yeah. and with what fits with, with what works, and that's kind of the great. Pro it's ever changing and ever collaborative. Okay. Wow. And, wow! And so, is this the norm for for most TV shows? Like every episode goes through such a rigorous, you know, approval. No, I don't no, I don't think so. I mean, I also every show is kind of different, but okay. I think that animation is just a very, very long process. Okay. It takes a while to animate all that stuff and do it and you know. Um whereas I think like just live action has a more compact process, obviously, because they just you write it and it gets shot. I mean, it's not as simple as that, obviously. <laughs> right, right, right. There are, uh, you know, obviously, there are rewrite processes, but with all this stuff, though, it goes through a lot, and and shows are generally very collaborative. Okay. You know, uh, everyone gets their hands on it a little bit. Yeah. Okay, so this one's uh, animated, and then Kevin's written. Well, I think most of it, everything else you've shows you've written on were more like a, like a newsy joke. Like you obviously did the Jim Jeffries show, you did John Oliver, and you did. Uh, totally, totally biased. Bias. Is that were, were those the other ones? And then this is your first time in more of like a storytelling animation yes. world. Yeah, I mean, the, yeah, I started in the in the whole uh, late night kind of okay space as they call it, and um, and yeah, most of it very new, all of it really very sort of news oriented and stuff. Even like on Best Week Ever, which was more pop culturey. It was still the the pop culture news of the the week or, or the month or whatever was going on. So okay, yeah, a little more sketchy, more sketch type stuff. But um, yeah. And do you have a favorite in writing amongst all those? Um, my favorite writers' room was the last week tonight writers' room. Um, just because it was. And that was all also, I don't know if it was the toughest, but it was definitely, I don't know. It, it was, I always say like totally biased. It totally biased was boot camp. That was like my first writing job. All right. And if totally biased was like boot camp, um, last week tonight was SEAL training. Oh, uh, wow. Okay. It was just, it, yeah, it just put you through it. But that, that room, those were um, some of the best joke writers I've ever worked with. In my life, in my in my career, um, but my favorite show is probably. I mean, I feel like everyone says this when you're at the show that they're on at the time, but um, it's it's the Great North. Okay. Okay. Because the, the, that's because I, I you know, I mean, look, as comics, we are sort of adjacent to that late night writing, the joke writing kind of a thing. That's how a lot of us get into TV. And so um, that was my first stop on the on the train, but I was always more of a um, I, a storyteller type of. That's what I was doing, like on the side. Even when Kamal and I were writing together, you know, we were writing movie scripts and stuff like that, and and sketches, and and things. so that was I was just better at that. Did you have a you have a favorite writing style between the late night style and writing for? Like, you know, like you're saying, like almost kind of sketchy versus right. versus versus a show. 
that's what I that's what I'm going to ask. Right. As right. far as the style, like right. you, you like, like one more than the other. Yeah, narrative writing. Definitely, okay. definitely I prefer that. It's just what I'm better at. You know, um, I always struggled with writing jokes, which is weird as a stand-up. But writing, being, writing stand-up is different than writing jokes for like John Oliver or Kamau or whatever TV show, or Jimmy Kimmel or whoever it is you're writing, writing jokes in that. Now, some people are very good at it and some of them, that writing style also lends itself to their stand-up. We all know comics like that who are great and who ha who's, their, their stand-up structure is more to that type of, writing right. right but not mine um not a lot of comics we know so it was i talked to another comedian who wrote for late night and she was like yeah i'm, I'm not a great joke writer why is my doorbell ringing <laughs> <laughs> I'll I'll got a... in a second. i know what's going on i thought you had something in the oven Man, <laughs> so got a doorbell. I, I have, there's a whole thing going on i'll be i'll be right back sorry okay. Okay. give me two seconds oh. Okay. Uh, got, we got to guys. We got to talk about the wasps. I'll be right back. Okay. The wasps. <laughs> the wasps. The know, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. <laughs> we also. And that's funny. You're we also, from New England. <laughs> <laughs> we also got to talk about. Um, remember, I told you last week that there was a a, a purchase that he made. There was a purchase that he made. Oh yeah, we, I gotta go gotta grab. Discuss. Let me go grab mine. Okay, all right. <laughs> I'm on shoulders. Uh, uh, I'm that was on pretty shoulders. funny. People like that, right? I'm on shoulders. Uh, 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 uh. Yeah, they did. They enjoyed my shoulder dance. Like, oh, come on. Everybody love a, a dancing black man. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, there's a black dude dancing. Oh, America loves uh, dancing black people. Dancing black people or black men and. Uh, Heavy set black women. They love heavy set black women. A heavy set black woman with an attitude for America to be on her. They all she gotta do is come on and say one time, I don't know, I ain't taking nothing from nobody. People are like, yeah, the big black woman said that shit. <laughs> right. People love that. Hey, dude, you see that? We're like uh we're we're hitting the charts in Lebanon right now. Dude, that's awesome. That is awesome. <laughs> well, it's pretty funny. Dude. It's number 52 in the comedy. <laughs> group I'm like how many yeah. comedy podcasts in lebanon are there i guess so i would thought we'd be number one <laughs> maybe, maybe <laughs> or maybe well, there's guess. probably a lot of american ones they might listen to well you know but i bet if it's we all were, because of we, john all because of john yeah. and his oh absolutely awesome interview but you know also i think if we would have put uh political comedy because honestly that that whole episode it wasn't necessarily funny comedy yeah. wise right yeah it had more of a political slant once we got into what it was so that one might have been that could be miscategorized if we if we were in the political comment section who knows it might have been a, a a lot higher on the list maybe my right? buddy just yeah. texted me yesterday he listened to it and he said that episode was amazing oh good good yeah that was a cool so i think cool you know lab. we gained traction dude all right there he is back. back in it he jumped in like Sorry, that man, man. It's all good. <laughs> Would you get an order no. from the mail? So no. Okay, so I have had. I, I feel like Reggie. Maybe I've told you about this okay. since I moved in this place. I lived here for four years. Uh, nice place too, by the way. What had, neighborhood are you in? What neighborhood huh? is that? What neighborhood is that? Uh, hey, don't worry about it. Ah! <laughs> Yeah, can I have us over for a little barbecue? I yeah, uh, awesome. no, I have you over, but not 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 everybody. East um, side of town, east side of town. Yeah, I'm east. Um, I have I've had wasps getting in the house since I've lived here. So like the first two years I lived here, and it was seasonal. I would just look up. I'd be sitting right here chilling. There's a TV right in front of me. And I look over to the window over here or that one back covered with the curtain, just the wasp just hanging out on the window. On the inside and of the window. I, I, inside, oh. inside the house, repeatedly. And so I, over like the course of like two years, I killed probably a dozen wasps. And then they were gone. 
And then when lockdown happened, there was a beehive right outside the house there. And I was like, eh, let them do their thing. There'd be, I hadn't had any wasps in like over a year, year and a half, whatever it was. I was like, I think the wasp situation, I think they're gone. Except one night a bee gets in the house and I don't know how any of these things are getting in. I just know they're showing up in here. I freak the hell out. I don't, I don't care for bees and or wasps. And so we called these guys, they came over, checked it out and they were like, oh no, it's not, it's not in the tree outside the house. It is, you have it's a in beehive the in the wall yep. where the wall meets the roof. Ooh. And that's how they, you know. And so, so these guys came over, they took the beehive out, everything, it was fine. The day that I went to vote, uh, I don't know if you remember, we had a big election last year. I've heard. Uh, the day that I went to vote, <laughs> came back, I was feeling good, did my duty. <laughs> And I could, as I walked in, I could hear a um, someone out in the back there with like a weed whacker, or just, you know, one of those those mm. I don't know, someone doing yard work. Right. Yeah, it was loud as hell though, and it was just like a, a nice older woman who lives next door. I was like, what's she doing out there with the weed whacker? What's going on? And as I like, get close, it's not a weed whacker. There's a there's a massive black carpenter bee just in the window and they are loud as hell. Trying oh, he's trying to get, to get out. out. He's trying to, he's hitting the trying window. To get out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh... But it's like, man, <laughs> it's, it's the worst. And I'm just like, I don't know how I mustered the, the strength and courage to kill that thing. Yeah, sorry, sorry, America. I he just didn't the open the window. <laughs> or you got a screen. No, the window doesn't open. It do that window doesn't open. Oh, okay, okay. It's what did you use to kill it? it? There's a uh, yeah. What was the murder weapon? A, um, it was a, it was a boot. It was something heavy. I, this, a book. This can of raid. <laughs> can. I got, I got a can. Oh, raid and a, and a, a can. some kind of book because it was wedged. It was precariously, I'm gonna give a little show and tell here. It was it was wedged <laughs> between this little area right here. Can you see this? Yeah. It yeah. Was like, it was like this one. There's not a lot of movement to just come at it with a flat surface. Cause usually I have a book I could hit it with or um or large index cards, like a pack of them that's still wrapped, and I just go boom. And I and I take out, <laughs> but that guy was in there in a precarious place. And as you know, uh, you know, as Omar from the Wire always told us, you come at the king, you best not miss. So um, you you don't want to swing at at an angry bee or wasp and not kill it. <laughs> that, you, that could be your ass. <laughs> you got you got, you got a battle. <laughs> yeah, that's your ass. <laughs> so. So it, yeah, I had to kill that thing. So that was the last time I I had. That was November, twenty twenty. Okay. And uh, maybe late October twenty twenty. And um, when I was like, all right, and that was a freak incident. Okay. Chilling the other day on a Zoom meeting in my office. I have a little a little office area over here. Okay which is where I might normally be Zooming from, except uh, I was in a Zoom meeting <laughs> and I look up, wasp just flying around above me in the middle of this meeting. They can see me as clearly as you can see me now. I'm ducking and dodging and oh, dipping man. out and back in and grabbing stuff and then trying to slap my computer to shut the video off. Cause I realized, oh, they can all see this. Trying to shut the screen <laughs> off. Finally, my big hand gets up there, just boom, and slams it down. And I could hear the people in the meeting like, well, I don't know what happened. He was suddenly like ducking and, and <laughs> thought he was being he was a, He was attacked. <laughs> yeah, and then I had to explain to him, guys, there's a wasp in my place. So I shut these doors, and it has been in there since last Friday. Wow. Still in there? And, um, I was told that it was dead by now, or that it is dying. And I believe that they can't last very long without water. Um, wait, bees what? will die within hours in the okay, house. Okay, so wait, hold up. How did he get in? How do you know he just hadn't left the way I he got don't... in? 
Yeah, he could be going out getting a sip and then coming back in, right? Go out, go get a sip. He didn't come, come in, in through there. Oh, okay, I think okay. they, I think they've come in somehow through the. They find a way. There's somewhere in this room I'm in right now. This is the entry point. Okay. I love that and, you know um, how much uh, how much water a, a wasp or a bee must need. <laughs> you know so much about it. I've, had, I've done extensive research. I've done yeah. extensive research. I, I can tell you a bee when it gets in your house uh, can only f like it will after 45 minutes to maybe an hour it is grounded. It can no longer fly. If it's when a bee has been separated from the from the hive or the queen or whatever or any sustenance that it needs or whatever can only fly for about 45, 50 minutes from what I understand. Once it is grounded, it will die within a couple of hours, wow. unfortunately for that bee. Okay. okay, that's good to know. So if you find a bee in your house, just let it go for a little bit and it'll, it'll chill. Wasps can last a little bit longer, but after a few days, they start, they start to die if they aren't already dead. They can't handle, they can't go very long without water. And um, so he's been in there. I bought, so we called a wasp guy. So they came out, looked at the place, and they're here now treating all the exterior entryways. Okay. Wow. And yeah, I'm like something. Everything. Yeah. Something needs to be sealed up, right? Like there's there's a hole somewhere. Oh, I've been trying. So what I did is I bought a bee suit. <laughs> sure. Oh yeah, I saw this on Instagram. <laughs> I forgot about no. this. He did. He bought, yeah. He yeah. bought a bee yeah. suit. But I, well, guess, I peeped out face just now, and he just went. He just did this. <laughs> well, I just want to know. All, my question is this now, because I don't know this. This is a serious question. Do bee suits work for wasp? <laughs> like, did you get a wasp you get a, suit? <laughs> you got to get a wasp suit. I never heard of a wasp suit. Maybe, <laughs> maybe that's an option. Like, I don't a know. Wasp suit comes with, it comes with an ascot and a, a top hat. Um, <laughs> no, a, a. Like can, can you use Summer's okay. Eve in the winter? Like, I don't know if that's <laughs> for, like, I don't know. So, if we... <laughs> I bought this bee suit, this bee suit uh, on, like, I, I, I don't know, I found it online somewhere. I did, I should have splurged because I got the bargain. <laughs> And it's like a two piece, it's green, first of all. Normally they're white or yellow. <laughs> you got the this green suit that is a two piece. A two piece is the first problem. You want a whole full head to toe. Yeah, you gotta get the whole. <laughs> he said, yeah. I should have splurged. You got the budget. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, you don't want to go janky on your bee suit. No, so, like, man. it has the ties and the thing, the whatever, so you can pull it tight and stuff. But like no gloves, the 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 screen that goes over your face, it doesn't connect properly. You can just tuck <laughs> it in the collar thing. You can just tuck it in and then zip up the thing. But you it, like a savvy bee or wasp can get up in there and then they're in your suit. Dude, you know? And and also, yo, the mesh over your face, like you can't see. <laughs> so you're just wandering around, you're just Mr. Magoo. <laughs> trying to find like a tiny a thing flying around it's it's terrible so i went out so when this guy showed up i was like fuck it i went out and bought a new one and a proper you splurge you, you i splurge oh I good splurge. yeah you, you, and you can't um, have a, the janky bee suit bro but what are you using it into the suit? you wear it around the house or you because when i attack them i mean no i just chilling it with well, it on? No, with a... <laughs> dude, he would. He got a dude. He had a he had a wasp in his house, man. He would have got a bee suit. Yeah. When you wear it, I have to kill the thing. The wasp, so I could do it with no fear. Yeah. Plus, I, I you... it's just something I could throw on comfortably when I need to go to the grocery store or whatever. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. You know, just chilling your bee suit. Just neighborhood, <laughs> just general neighborhood wear. You yeah, don't know. Just, I can see you right now walking down the street saying hi to people like, hey, how you doing in your, in your bee suit? Yeah. So when you're going to kill the no, bee, so, so I, you put on the whole suit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, like, okay, I'll tell you something. I'll tell you something. When I had to kill the carpenter bee, I think I went and put the suit on. <laughs> I like think I, wait, wait, hold, hold it though. Hold on. Here's a, here's a legitimate question though. Like, are you allergic to bee stings? Like, if you get stung, would you have a severe reaction? Because that's a that's a thing for people. Like, people, some people can get no. stung and, and die. He's just scared. Um, no. <laughs> no, yeah. 
<laughs> I'm just terrified by it. I'll tell okay. you why. I'll tell you why. Okay. When I was a kid, when I was about four or five, I was at camp. A wasp flew into my ear and stung me repeatedly. Oh. oh. Just got up in there. Oh. And I couldn't get it out. Because when you're oh. a kid, what's your reaction? Yeah. Ah. And that oh. just got it in there. Oh. So, yeah, man. No, okay. Yeah. Actually, say no more. That's oh, okay. Say All no right. more. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, this I, I, is why. I don't think anybody has that story except for you. That is insane. <laughs> that is insane. A repeated list. When is, is this it? Is this a new one? This is the new one. I haven't, I haven't, I've been working on my script, so I haven't had a time, a chance to go in there. Oh, he's and unveiling hunt it. Oh, lock you down. Yeah. This is, so this wait, is breaking the wasp there. You ordered a new the suit un, while the wasp was the, in there. Oh, man, this is crazy. The, the unboxing. The wasp is in there. Oh, that's the other thing, too. Like, normally they're out here and I kill them. I think once I found one on a window in the office and I was able to kill it, it flew into the office. I grabbed my comp I grabbed everything I could real quick and then I shut the doors. And I have not seen it since. Okay. So I lost it. So I don't, it is just at large. Uh, <laughs> I can't see it. So at I was large. like, I gotta go back in there and hunt it down. So we got the gloves. Oh, nice. Oh, oh look, look at this. Look at that. I can, I can tell I'll be able to think through this. We got the unboxing. I mean, I'll just, the yeah, unboxing. I'll just try it on. <laughs> Yeah, I'm yeah, put that DC. on for us. It's one piece. Ooh, oh, that man, looks that, legit, dude. That looks legit, dude. That's some that's like a a, a NASA See? space suit. Here's the crazy thing. Here's the crazy thing. When I said, you know, you want to, you don't want to go cheap on the B suit. I don't know what I paid for the other one because this was only forty bucks. Oh, so what? how cheap was I when I was like, yeah, the other one was I, the, 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 the other one was free. <laughs> the other one was free. <laughs> Yeah. Like someone made the other one in their yeah. basement. Yeah, exactly. They, just, they gave you some. The other one clothes. I just found on the street somewhere. I just <laughs> exactly. found it on the street. Like, no, this could I mean, work. I don't even know if you can call it a B suit if it doesn't have gloves, <laughs> right? Like that's the whole point, right? <clears throat> no gloves. <laughs> no gloves. Oh, that's. I don't want put it on. I don't. You want don't I feel like this. You don't want the B suit that comes with a belt, right? Like. <laughs> No, you want the no. B suit that has two pieces. You got to tuck your shirt in, put the belt tight. Like, now, here's oh, the thing. Man. I also, I don't want the real B people to see me in this suit while I'm here. Like, oh, yeah. You like, I don't want them to be like, well, what are we doing here then? Yeah. Hang on. Push this back. Yeah. Yeah. Or they may think that you collect the honey. Ooh, like, hey, you can go goes. get the honey from over. Whoa, here we go. That's like a chemical, like a this. Teflon suit, I see. Yeah. You're looking like uh, Walter White in, in Breaking Bad. Right? Yeah. Oh, this is how I cook my meth and go to Target. There you go. <laughs> in, a, in a pandemic. Now, can the B suit oh, be effective against COVID? Right? Like, can we use that as an option? Wow, well, I think look it would get to oh, this is No, amazing. you can't because it's mesh. It's mesh. You need to have, you got to wear the mask. Yeah. Whoa. I'll look. put like newspaper. I'll put saran wrap over this. There you go. But yo, y'all, you know what I just realized? <laughs> somebody somebody <laughs> just found a Halloween costume. Dude, that's a great Halloween costume. That's a great yeah. Halloween costume. Dude, you gotta put the gloves on too. Put the gloves on. I would have seen. Does it have uh, footsies? You got footsies? No, no footsies. But that I got some shoes for that. Dude, those gloves are hell long. Like you're gonna inseminate a cow. Yeah. I feel like I'm going to the ball. There you go. <laughs> the bee ball. Um, right? I don't think I've, wow. I've, I've never witnessed anybody put on a whole bee suit before. I, the helmet. Actually, I've never, I never seen anyone receive a bee suit and put on a bee suit. Guys, I just want to thank you for having me on the <laughs> podcast. I'll tell you what we're gonna do. Oh, this is great! And look, now this you can see. Now you I can, can see. see way clearly. Now here's yeah. what we're gonna do: live on your podcast, we're gonna go into my office and try to find that wasp. All right, here oh, we go. all right, all right. This is probably it's probably dead. Gonna, I assume. All right. This is yeah. not what you thought was gonna happen. No. Now this would be, I gotta tell you, I'm a little scared. Even with the suit on. Even with the suit, you're right. I, but see, I'm just, yeah, it's an unrealistic. You don't have any ankles exposed or anything because I hate for him to be on the <laughs> no. ground. Come up and see, I think, I think he's up, up, I think he's up there. First of all, my office is a mess right now. Pardon, pardon, okay. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just gonna go up here and take a peep. Dude, this is like uh, 
Blair Witch Project movie, but with the hornets. Yeah. Right, the wasps. Go. Look at all that paper. I know. I got I can't. You know oh shit. Part. Oh, you see it? <laughs> I see him. I see no him. way. I see him. I see him. He's not is he still alive? He's on one of my motherfucking books. <laughs> oh, read read Nas Wasp. <laughs> <laughs> see this book? Okay, look. Okay, look. You see the book on the you see that that blue thing on the bookshelf, on the top of the bookshelf? The, yeah, yeah, top corner. Yeah. Look down. Look down at the top. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, it there it is. I do see yeah, it, it is, on the second right book. Is it dead? I think it's dead, dude. Touch it. It's not moving. Well, it looks like is I'm it moving? Touching it. <laughs> at least we found it. Yeah. Okay, I'm just I'm just going to just going to back Kill out. It. He's thirsty, dude. No, don't kill yeah. him. He's thirsty, bro. Go get him a little. Go get him a little cap full of water. So can... you see the problem. He's in an impossible area. To... I gotta have to spray him. Yeah, but then you get your... to... but then your books are gonna be soaked in, in rage. Look, I will order another book. <laughs> oh wait, That's hilarious. Oh, did he? One of the books is. Oh no, he's not on the. Yeah, he's on the. He's on the Judd Apatow. Judd Apatow. I found this funny book. Is he? Is he alive though? I think he's dead or dying, which is what the guy said. Okay. The guy who came before, he's like, that dude, he's, he's just sitting somewhere. Um, drying out was the expression he used. Okay. Well, <clears throat> well, we found, anyway, we found the wasp. We got we to see found it. This is awesome, dude. To see you in I'll, this right uh, here. This is pretty feel, amazing. I feel like. I kind of lightweight want to get one. To be honest with you, I kind of like cool. to get one. Yeah, I kind of want to get one. So, I mean, get get a you you want to get as big as you can. This is a double extra large. Oh my god! Really? How many? No, yeah. They don't have like the big, the big and small, big man, big and tall. Uh, <laughs> big and tall. Suit. Yeah, the big and tall. <laughs> you know, down at the mall, big and tall B suit. Yeah, um, I'm like I can't wear that. <laughs> if that's a double X on you, that ain't gonna fit me, bro. I bought two. I bought an XL and I bought a double XL because okay. I wasn't sure of the sizes. And and I this time I'm taking no chances. I'm taking no shorts, y'all. Taking no shorts. <laughs> taking awesome. no shorts. <laughs> right, anyway, yeah. so that's what I've been up to. Well, um, I was wondering, like you were saying, how you like to write these stories and stuff. Were you writing yeah. stories as a kid? Like, were you? And we obviously know the bees affected you, but how about the writing? Um, uh, or did you read a lot? Her. It, was I what? Did you did, read, did a I lot? read a lot? Yeah, like I as did, a kid, I writers. Did not. As a kid, I did not read. I didn't read till I was till I was older, till I, uh, till I was an adult, and then I was like reading. I learned to read. I mean, I I learned to read. I think fairly young, but um, I was not one who was like digging into a book all the time. So you weren't uh, like an avid reader, like you weren't the kids no. consuming books. Okay. No. Um, when I was an adult, what I what happened is I started reading. I mean, I read stuff, but I really started reading like a movie was gonna come out and I would read the book before I went and saw the movie. Mm, well. And then I just started reading more and more and more stuff. Now I love to read. Um, but I yeah, when I was young, I remember. A, there was a kid in my in my class. I think this was the third grade. This kid named Greg Kelly. We all had to write some kind of do some kind of presentation or story or book report or whatever. And he wrote this story about a carrot that went through the process of being the from the process of I think being picked on all through manufacturing and going through the the thing and getting on the truck and doing all this stuff. He read this story to us, and I remember being just enthralled like just wow. like what's okay what's gonna happen to this carrot net like there was something so weird about how i connected to this carrot character oh, wow. okay. um and i fell in love with the idea of stories and, and stuff through i think through that that was my first memory of being like i i want to write i want to create something like this wow and so, wow that is so, why all my stories are about carrots. <laughs> so this kid, this kid was your first inspiration. In he really was. To... I never told him that. I don't know where he is now, but uh, that's his name, Greg Kelly. 
Dragon wow, Death. Don't cool. do that, internet. Don't. <laughs> Let me ask you this. So that was writing. Um, when when did comedy come into play? Like, what's your earliest memory in regards to laughing, I mean, being able to make people laugh, enjoying laughing, or you know, creating the oh, haha? Yeah, around the same time because after that I would write things in class, um, and I would always try to write funny sort of stories or essays because a lot of times you had to read them to the class. So it was like performing. It was like doing stand up, and you know my earliest taste of doing anything related to stand-up was it always sounds weird to say this now but you know I had my parents they had all these old Richard Pryor and Bill Cosby and Flip Wilson records wow that's a, and that's so a... I would do I would perform Pryor at the time I liked some of it but a lot of it was over my head because I was I was so young uh, I loved Flip Wilson but Cosby all those Cosby routines, that was the sweet spot for a kid who was in the third grade or the fourth grade or whatever. And so I used to perform those. And that was my first taste of like performing and making people laugh. So I would write my own stuff and, and then perform that for the class. Wow. And it was weird because I always thought, I always dreamt of being a comedian. I never imagined that I actually could because I was like, I don't get how they write all those jokes. Meanwhile, I'm writing this shit myself and performing it, but like I never made right. the connection that oh, what you're doing is essentially this is what stand-up is, right. and it took me years to figure that out. Um, but yeah, so that was right around you know like whatever eight, nine, ten, eleven years old is when I was doing all that. Wow. And then you okay. grew up. You grew up where? San Jose. San Jose, California. And, yeah. and then how did you end up starting getting to stand up in the San Francisco scene? Um, I, uh, used to, after I used to hang out at a club called Rooster Tea Feathers, um, Sunnyvale. in Sunnyvale. Yeah. And Rooster Tea Feathers and another club called The Last Lap in San Jose. And I would just go and hang out and watch the shows, but, um, and they were, they were very supportive of me as just a guy, as a, as a regular customer. I got to know the, the regular opener slash manager at the last laugh and he would introduce me to the comics there and I would hang out with the headliners and, and those guys would give me little tidbits before I even started of how to approach it um and then at Roosters uh the owner at the time Jessica Jenkins she kind of you know was just very nice and supportive and did the same thing introduced me to the comics she knew that I wanted to do it she knew, like all of us know, when you see somebody who's just sitting in the back of the room watching. Right. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're like, yeah. oh, look at this, look at this one. Yeah. So yeah. She knew, and then some of the other comics who had come through, they knew. I remember uh, uh, Will Walls, comedian Will Walls, uh, San, a San Francisco staple at the time that I started. He came back and was just talking to me. In the, in the back of the room, and he was finally like, so when are you going to get up and do it? And I was like, come on, what, what do you mean? I don't, I don't uh, know. Yeah. I would never do such a thing. And he was like, man, please. And so he helped to sort of push me. And, and, and it was finally another comedian who, who kind of uh, tripped it. And now I'm blanking on the brother's name. Uh, he's from Portland. And he was, Jessica introduced me to him after, <clears throat> damn, I was just talking about this guy. She introduced me to him after we we're talking and she's like, yeah, he wants to go up and do comedy one day, but I don't know, he's, you know. And the guy was like, yeah, uh, well, you should do it. And, you know, and she's like, we have an open mic in a couple of weeks. And I was like, okay, yeah, whatever. We wrap up the conversation eventually saying goodbye. He's like, all right, so you're gonna do it? Yeah, man, I'll do it, yeah. yeah. And then he looks at me and I'll never forget this. He goes, don't say you're going to do it if you're not going to do it. And I was uh -huh. like, oh, man. <laughs> and I remember going back to the car. I, my friends were waiting for me, and I was like, shit. I'm like, what's going on? <laughs> it's funny about that. Guy. It's funny that guy had some authority, even though you don't know him, right? He's not a parent. Like, he can't even right, hold, right. You, hold you accountable, but just say, don't say you're going to do it if you're not. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. And so I had two weeks. I had a day job at the time, like a nine to five office day job in 
tech. I, I didn't know anything about tech or what I was doing. I hated the day job, but I would leave work at four, take a break, go see a movie, do whatever, come back a few hours later when everyone was gone from the office. And I would just write oh, left wow. till 11, 12, one in the morning. Wow. And For an open mic. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, I had, I was like, I got to write five minutes of material. I don't know what five minutes really feels like, you know? And so, <laughs> so you wrote like a hundred pages. <laughs> I just wrote stream of consciousness. Oh, I wrote, wow. I had just, you know, Chris Rock's Bring the Pain had recently come out and Dana Carvey's HBO special had come out. And I had been writing for five years off and on, saying I was going to do it and then been back. Wow, so it was five years before you, you've been writing for five years before you actually got up on stage. Yeah, and wow. it was terrible stuff. But when those two specials came out, I watch them and I was like, oh, that's how I should, that's how I want to do it. That's how I want to write for myself. That's how, the fact that they, how they would take a topic and just, just stretch it yeah. out and go into mm -hmm. as many nooks and crannies mm -hmm. of that and, and explore all the avenues. And they were talking about what they, you know, this thing as opposed to just, joke and move on, joke and move on, joke and move on, which is great. Some comics do that and that's that's their thing. And that, that's a whole other style. But this is where I was like, oh, this is where I fit. And so, yeah, I just wrote Stream of Consciousness through that, picked out the little bits and pieces that I thought were funny and then created the jokes out of that. And, and it ended up working for me. I did that first open mic and it went well. And the guy there told me, well, now you have to go to San Francisco and do, you got to hang out at the punchline. You got to hang out at Cobb's Comedy. You know, he sort of, and I think Will Wall sort of helped usher me in. And then, you know, as you know, Tony Sparks, yeah. sort of when you get walking through the door of San Francisco comedy, he was there waiting for you. Like, yeah. You know, yeah. Oh, on, welcome, come on in. And so. Yeah. Tony's like the ambassador. The yeah, <laughs> yeah. He, he really is. So, yeah. But I'm sorry. So what were you, the first time I met? Well, I was going to just ask uh, Reg, if he remembers the first time meeting Kevin Avery. The first time I saw Kevin Avery was at Rooster Teeth Feathers. And yeah. it was in 2003. Oh. It was in 2003. I was in the finals of the Rooster Teeth Feathers, the uh, the first annual Rooster Teeth Feathers comedy Oh, yeah, this is the first time winner right, right here. <laughs> yes. And Kevin hosted the show and he closed out the show. Like, as they're telling the votes, Kevin was doing his time. And then... Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, so you know... Obviously, for me in that competition, you know, I walk around the room, I'm talking to myself, I'm in the back, I'm shadow boxing, all this kind of stuff. So I kind of peek my head in a little bit and just kind of watch. And whenever I saw Kevin, I was like, yo, this dude was killing. I was like, yeah. the fir the, my first memory of Kevin Avery was at Rooster Teeth Feathers, killing. Wow. Killing. <laughs> I remember, <laughs> like, you know, killing. And the room was packed. The room was packed. And and then I won. And then Kevin was like, he was the one to introduce. And I and think Rich never talked to me again. <laughs> well, we didn't see each other again for we didn't see each other again for a long time because I wasn't hanging out the punchline, right? And he was like, I made it, baby. And he was like, <laughs> yeah, I'm done, son. I'm yeah. done. I mean, I'm like Vegas. I'm like <laughs> <laughs> it's like I got one. Right? I'm out. Yeah. I'm out. <laughs> I remember Dude, I, the first time I met Kevin, I, I don't know if you remember this. He did, there was a show in Modesto at the Red Lion and they were putting on like that 24 hour, 48 hour show. They're trying to do the longest comedy oh, show ever. Oh, yes. Yeah, I remember that. That's, and I, I went and yeah. I saw, that's where I saw Kevin. And then I was telling him I was trying to get into comedy. And he was like, go, you go, go to the punchline, hang out at the punchline. And that was where it all started. Uh, hey, dude, hold on. I'm, yeah, one of my favorite movies. And I really appreciate uh, Kevin and Kamal for this because if you remember in Emeryville, there used to be um, Kimball's East. Yeah, I've done Kimball's, Kimball's East. Oh, East yeah. In Emeryville, yeah, yeah, right? yeah. So um, at this time, I wasn't hanging out the punchline really, like not consistently. And I did mm -hmm. Kimball's East. At this point, you were there, Kamal was there, and we had just done it. And we we're in a little green room behind the stage or to the, the left of the right. stage, right? And mm -hmm. I, I remember being in that room and you guys were like, dude, what are you doing? Right, like, what are you doing? I'm like, I just, you know, I kind of hang out. You're like, they're like, how come you're not hanging out the punchline, dude? You should be hanging out the punchline. You should be doing the thing. All right, look, we're gonna, we're gonna talk to Molly. You're ready for this. It's not a big deal. You've been doing it for a while. You just whatever. And and that was the beginning. Cause I guess you guys have kind of mentioned mentioned me to her. They're like, yeah, this is guy. He's mm -hmm. been inconsistent hanging out or whatever. And then I came to, and this was the funny part. Was uh, not the funny part, but 
Robert Hawkins was at the San Jose Improv. I'm sure you don't even remember this, but Robert Hawkins was at the San Jose Improv. You, Molly, and Kamau went to go see Robert. I just, because I was in at the yeah. Improv at that time, I just happened to go down there because I was like, oh, let's go see what's, what's happening on the show. I get there mm-hmm. and I see you and Kamau and you guys kind of know me lightweight. And Molly was like, okay, so wait, what's going on here? You know these guys, but you're here at the Improv. Like you can just walk in here and come upstairs like, yeah, I work here pretty regularly, whatever. <laughs> and she was like, okay, look, uh, these guys say you're funny. I'm sure you are. If you're working here, then, you know, and that was a whole, I'm not going to get into that whole story, but that was the whole story. And that was the beginning of like basically first week at the punchline with Sue Murphy. And that was all because of you and Kamal oh, saying man. something to Molly and kind of basically lightweight vouching for me, like endorsing yeah, me. Wow. I'm like, yeah, we've seen this guy. He's funny, um, you know. And so, yeah, yeah. That was, so I would add to you and Kamal, man, as far as like wow. name dropping, dropping my name. To the person and then Reggie never happen. spoke to us again. He was like, I need Manny out. And then <laughs> that's, that's it. Vegas. <laughs> that's how we do. Hey, uh, I gotta ask wow. you about uh you were uh you were in a boy band, weren't you? Coming up. <laughs> well, hold up though. Go. Wait, hold up though, hold up. Before you go there, ASAL, there's a there's a difference because come on, I mean, come on. Kevin and I have talked about this as far as like bef- prior to in sync. Backstreet Boys and uh what's the other one? There's one new more. Kid, well, not uh, new kids. New kids. I'm, no, not new kids. <laughs> that new was kids. later. New yeah. kids. But prior to that, they were not called boy bands. Right. They new called? kids was the yeah. New kids on the block was the first boy band. The first boy band, but they were put together. But prior to that, what were they called? Yeah. Like so boys were and singing groups. They were singing, the singing groups. Group. That's what it was. All okay. The singing groups. So what yeah, were you in? Were you because it was were you like, a singing group? You were a singing group? We were in a singing group. He was in a singing group. When I was doing it, uh, the boy band had not, they had just been invented. And it was just, it was a thing that was wildly, had only been taken off for a few years. But like, we patterned ourselves after like New Edition and, and you know, then later sort of Jodeci and, and that type of thing. Uh, but yeah, like there was, there were um, the Temptations and Gladys Knight and the Pips and the Four Tops and all these these groups. They were just singing groups. Singing groups. That was yeah. and it was a whole big. That was a phenomenon in the whatever. The, I guess the fifties and sixties is that was doo groups. You know, yeah. that, that Earth, Wind, and Fire. Earth, Wind, and F- Earth, Wind, and Fire band. Oh, Commodores they- band. Right, because they're up there doing. Can they you actually know, play like, band? That's what I was gonna ask. Is yeah. it? Can you call it a boy band if none of the like, if none of them play instruments? Ask right. all those white girls in the nineties. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Brittany. Yeah, I'm, like, so, I'm like, how could you be a boy band? That's why they were a group. That's why they were just a group. You know, uh, right? Like, exactly. exactly. What was the name There's of no your thing singing as a group? group band. <laughs> What was the name we of the were, singing group? Uh, we were. Uh, Sorry, I just laughter because I just know I know that uh, you know Kevin. I know you, right? So I I know yeah, some of this stuff. Story, I want to hear the name. <laughs> we were called for now. We went through several name changes. We were called for now. Was it five of y'all? Though? <laughs> no, there were six. There were six of you. Six. That's what it was. It was <laughs> six of you called for now. I just spell four. My fault. It was the number four, and now, yeah, it was all. It was wrong on all counts. <laughs> it was my fault, and I'll just tell you really quickly what happened. The, our very first like performance on a show, we had not thought of a name, and the some woman, the stage manager, some woman with a clipboard comes on up to us while we're rehearsing at the show, you know, which was going to be in a few hours. And she was like, how are we introducing you? What do you, what do you guys call yourselves? And we were like, oh yeah, that. <laughs> and so I, I said, well, you know, for now, um, <laughs> and she was like, whatever asshole. And just wrote it down and walked away. <laughs> we fully intended to revisit this a little later and give her an actual name, but we all forgot. And then cut to the show we're standing behind the curtain, ready to go on. All right, this is it, fellas. We are about to do this. And we just, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome 
for now. What the fuck? Curtain raises and we just, uh, can you? St-? Like, that was it. Was, I guess we're oh, cool. and it's six dudes. It's six dudes. Six of us. It's six dudes. So yeah, I know there are people in the audience going, well, hold on a minute. One, two, three. <laughs> this one don't make no sense. Oh my God. So yeah, but we were four now and then we, then we lost two members and there were actually four of us. Oh, there you and go. that's when we changed the name to Forces of Nature. Ooh. And not spelled with a four. And uh, <laughs> and then we got, or no, it was, it was three of us, I think, actually. And then there were four of us and we changed it to Alias. Alias. I don't know why. Okay. They were like, I don't like the name Forces of Nature. And I was like, but I that's like a mouthful. that name. You don't no, think I, li- I like it. Did you guys ever record? Yeah, we. I'm. I'm looking at a bunch of demo tapes right over there. Hey, under what? Under alias or forces of nature? Or for now? Under under all of it. We we have some. We did some covers of stuff as like when we were for now, and then once we really started um, recording our our own stuff, we were forces. And so then did and each. And, and, did each okay. member have like a name? <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. What was, what was your name? name? Because we were also like, we were also like, uh, we were like an R&B slash rap group. Oh yeah. <laughs> Three of us were rappers. Were you, which so, one were you? I was, I mostly rap, but I would also sing backup and harmonize. I did, a, I had a few little leads, but, um, I wasn't. I was never like a singer. Right. I could. I could freestyle my ass off back then. Mm-hmm. I can't anymore. And I could. You know. I and I wrote music for the group. So um, you guys recorded original, like original songs. Yeah. 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 Oh, dude. They're not that it. great. Yeah. yeah are they anywhere? Still, can we hear these songs anywhere? Yeah. You you haven't posted them anywhere? Come on. No. No. Oh come on! I listened to them recently, and I was like, I listened to them recently, and I was like, maybe I'll, because they're not digitized, and so I think, well, some of them are, and and I was like, maybe I'll post some of the, and then I listened, and I was like, I'm not posting any of this. No, no. come on! No come on. way! No. There was like, there are a couple of, um... yeah, no. What's oh, uh? Okay. You you don't want to tell us uh, your your singer name? Oh, yeah. oh, it was it was uh, it was K Ray, K Ray. K Ray, what what is? I thought what was Golden Graham? I heard Golden Graham from you before. No, oh, you know what that was? That was me. Eliza Skinner had that show where comics battle each other, oh. and and um, and you had to come up with a name, and I would pick a name to. I did the show a couple, two or three times. Uh, the first time I did it was with Baron Vaughn. Um, oh, wow. And he, we were on, yeah, you had to, I think this one, we, we were, it was rap teams. And so Baron and I were rapping together. And I think I called myself Golden Graham. That's so funny. That night. And then one <laughs> night, I think I was probably talking to you about it. Because remember, we used to freestyle at the punchline every now Yes, we used yeah. to. Yeah, I would freestyle with Kevin and, and Jasper. I have, and I, yeah, yeah, I may have said Golden Graham then. And yeah. I would watch. Parker. Yeah, yeah. I can't freestyle for Jack. So, hey Kevin. Uh, all right, before we <clears throat> we gotta we gotta delve into this real quick because um, you and I, you had, I got a phone call last week from Kevin, um, and we were just discussing <laughs> setting this up. And Kevin says to me, "Hey, I bought my first oh, pair yeah. of Jordans today." Nice, right? buddy. Yeah. And so, yeah, yeah. Um, I personally have never bought a pair of Jordans. And I feel like that's such a commitment. And that surprises me. I always got shoes for free as a basketball player. So I just oh, wore whatever man. I got. Yeah. No, and I Jordan's free. Uh, <laughs> but I never, but Jordans were always, Jordans were cool, but I just, they just never, they just, I was never drawn to them like that. I was never drawn to them. I could never get them as a never, kid. And then once I could afford then, like the quarantine, I got into them, Kevin. So I got a bunch of pairs right here. Really? I want to show you too. Yeah. I got into yeah, it. We, I want to see. Quarantine. Yeah, we want to see your Jordans, and we well, want to hear the story behind how you bought some Jordans and how you feel about that, because that's a whole like. Yeah, let's see them, dude. I want to now? see what you see what you got. I'll, I'll tell you something. I'll tell you something. I, when I was a kid, 
I was into Air Force Ones. Uh, that was a and nice I, too. And I remember, I remember having my uncle played football. He played Canadian football, and so he had like endorsement stuff. So he would get these shoes. So we, I remember me and my brother getting Air Force Ones for Christmas, and you know. Yeah. Um, but that's it. It kind of stopped after that, and then I just became like a Converse guy, uh. and that's what I've worn most of my adult life. I mean, I had other sneakers and shit like that, but like. I generally rock Converse as my shoe of choice. And then about three or four weeks ago, I was waiting for some takeout. I was sitting at this bar around the corner from me, run into this dude that I know, and he's got these Jordans on. And I was like, what are those? <laughs> goes, yeah, man, just bought these, blah, blah, blah. He goes, I bought them right over there. And there's a store right on the right across the street from where we were. And I was like, yo, I may have to, on the real, and and uh, I went and got them, and they're, ugh, they're these. Oh, these you got things. some ones. Jordan oh, ones. look at that. Okay, yeah, I you like went back to the black. Yeah, I, I don't even know what I bought. Those what are the is, ones. I don't know what's what. So here's the one. I got a one here. This is the one I have. But yeah, this. What does that logo. mean? What's the difference? That the this ones is his first the, shoe. His first the, shoe. The first shoe. But remember, yeah. the first okay. shoe was just black and red, black, red, and white. Right. But this right, is the style. Right, right, that right. style is so the that's thing. it's the same style as that shoe. So you got some now, oh, actually, My favorite okay. is is the three. Now the three is when they first started putting the air on the bottom, but the three oh, the has bubble. the elephant print, and this is my favorite. Like this is oh, the that one's oh, yeah, those are nice. Yeah, yeah, I got the air. These yeah. yeah, no, these were hard to find. The white ones are always so fucking hard to find. There's another right, right, I got. Right. I got the sky Hold blue up. threes. Oh, these nice. Are the first oh, pair nice. I got. Yeah, these are slick. And then, it's out. Yeah. Like oh, dude, I went, I got all, I know. You, going on you just got into these over the last year? Over the last year. I was just, because then they look good on wow. stage. I'll tell you what happened. Like, when I worked in Cleveland, I worked at the ballpark and I was like one of the only white dudes and people would make fun of my shoes all the time. They'd be like, man, your dogs are barking. Uh, right. And so then I, I'd, I'd go and buy, and I remember, <laughs> I'll never forget. Uh, like I bought a pair of shacks and this other guy already had shacks. So I didn't get as much love. Then I went and bought mm -hmm. some garnets and I walked in with the new garnets. I knew no one had them yet. And everyone's like, Oh, look at the new <laughs> garnets. I was like, yeah. So, <laughs> so then once I started performing on stage, you started seeing like, you know, people take pics and you like, you know, you're on stage, people look in your shoes. So then these, these are the fours I got. And oh. you know who just oh, got a pair of these sent to them was uh, Reggie's buddy Mahershala. He put a put picture up, and uh, yeah, these were hard to get, dude. But uh, yeah, those are nice. Those these are, are nice. those are kind of cool. But uh, yeah, I got totally into had, The only pair of Jordans I've ever had were um, they were given to me. My boy, mm -hmm. my boy Moki had a pair. Um, they had mm -hmm. the patent leather bottoms, like the the black that goes all the way around the bottom. He gave them to right. me. I tried them on. They didn't feel good. So I was like, it's a wrap. And then I got another pair. When, when my buddy Marcus got married, he gave all the groomsmen a pair of Jordans to change into for the reception. So we changed out of our, our dress shoes and then we oh, all put nice. on these Jordans and, you know, and got it going, whatever, right? Um, okay. Okay. Showed it, showed what is it that Greg used to say? Uh, what is it Greg Edwards used to say? You're too big to be dancing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you said Greg, it on the podcast Greg, last week. You all shoulders. Reggie. You all shoulders, Red. You hey, all shoulders, Red. Speaking of Greg, he, he brought up a Kevin Avery story last week. Uh, and it was pretty oh, funny about when you uh, had to open for Cat Williams. Oh, yeah. Oh, you got to listen to it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, talking, boy. He was talking yeah. about he was. No he was Jordan. No amount of Jordans could save me that day. That was, uh, yeah, just, was he t did he tell it? He did. Well, he, well, he says he, was, he, did. he didn't really tell. He said you, you before the, before it was happening, you're like, yeah, I got to do this for Cat Williams. Cause he saw you at the Seabiscuit when I, my open mic and you're yeah. like, yeah, that's not going to, right. This is going to suck. Well, no, no, though. Oh, go ahead. Go. Because but that was, was it. Yeah, and then was... you did the show and then he saw you again afterwards. He's like, Hey Kevin, how was that? He's like, like I said, it sucked. <laughs> Yeah, you're like it was good. It was good and terrible, but he was Greg's whole point was that he was just getting started at that point, and so he didn't quite understand uh -huh. 
you know, like, why wouldn't you have a great show with, with Cat Williams? Like, what's the big deal? And you're just like, right. Oh, no, it's going to be, it's going to be awful. <laughs> I mean, it, well, I'll just, I'll tell you as quickly as I can. Just, there were four shows, two Friday, two Saturday. I got booked on this at the last minute. And I was, and I had always struggled in black rooms. Um, and it's interesting you brought up Kimball's East because Kimball's East was a black room. Yeah. There was something about it that I don't, I don't know. I don't know what it was. Kimball's East was large. Mm -hmm. It was, it was huge. And there was a smaller crowd. Yeah. And always in this, Like they couldn't fill it. Yeah, yeah. They wouldn't fill the whole thing. So it was weirdly just like, like another open mic. And, and I just was like, I'm just going to go out and do my thing here. And it was a little bit experimental as opposed to like going to the end zone in Oakland where it was small <laughs> and they could pack it. Right. And if you weren't on your shit, I mean, I, I ate it both times I did the end zone. And, um, but so I was doing this where I used to see Cat Williams at the time, Cat in the Hat was yes. his name. Cat in the Hat. And, oh, wow. uh, and then he moved to LA and he, I think he had changed that. But so I went over, this was probably right after he did Friday. And I did not know how popular he really was. Oh yeah, after Friday. The, the shows were all sold out. And uh, I went there, first show, there was a comedian who was opening, who was the, the host, uh, who was very nice to me out of the gate. And to the point where he was like, like, oh man, when I heard I was going to be working with you, I was really excited. And I, I was like, I, I didn't know the guy. <laughs> and uh, but he's super nice. I'm setting up my camera and he, you know, and then, and then I went up and did my first, my first set and it just, just did not go great. And when he came up on stage after me, he, the first thing he said is, damn, y'all want your money back? And I was like, <laughs> what? <laughs> and so the second show that night, it oh, went a little man. bit worse. Second show, there were like a, there was a small spattering smattering of like booze when I walked off stage, Oof. and I remember him. He went up and did that bomb, set, just, like that whole. Deal. Oh was like, man, this dude is foul, <laughs> yo! That's foul, yo! So then the next day, Saturday, I was just like, "Oh my god, I can't! What am I? Gonna... <laughs> you stressing like, out about I this? I had never shit. been a afraid to go to a show before but i was just like i don't want to do this oh. i spent all day at the san francisco metreon like i was at a i went to a movie and then i would leave the movie and go to a bar across the street and then i went to another movie and then i went to the bar and then i finally was like i gotta go to this gig and i drove to this gig and safely i didn't i wasn't hammered right but um uh I went to this gig and um, the first show went all right. I was like, no. okay, you were okay, loose, maybe? here we go. Right. What? Was it what? You, you were loose? You were, you were just... I don't know what it was. I mean, it wasn't the alcohol. In fact, I think I'd seen another movie before I went to the show. Okay. The first show and Saturday. So it had nothing. First show Saturday. Yeah, I was like, okay, this isn't, it wasn't bad. It, I wasn't crushing by any means. Right. Um, but a guy in the audience was even like, hey man, you were funny. I was like, from like another time or <laughs> so you. I was like I all right it. one more show I got, this. I got this I got this right and and the crowd is it's starting late there's a crowd lined up outside oh, yeah. all manner of hat you've ever seen it's just you know and <laughs> and uh I get in there I did 11 I did less than that you know, you're doing 20, 25 minutes when you're middling. Yeah. And, you know, first joke, eh, second joke, mm, third joke, uh-oh. Oh. And then it just descends from there. And then I was just talking. And you know how that room is. It's, this is at the at Tommy T's, oh, uh, right. which is the Cadillac, the one in Concord. <laughs> and so it's like a, it's like a crab feed. Like it's just, it's a cafe, it almost, it feels like a cafeteria when it's right. at full volume. And people are just in there talking. Yeah. They're not listening. It just, the crowd is just talking over me. And, and then at some point they realize nobody's listening to this guy. And then it gets deathly quiet. And they're just listening to me eat it. And then a couple of people comment, throw, say some shit, a heckle here, there. And I finally just, I'd had it. And I said, look, 
I hate you as much as you hate me, but <laughs> I'm going to do my time and I'm getting paid anyway. So boo all you want, but this ain't the fucking Apollo. Nice. And nice. Like, what? like, oh. Everything. People were throwing things on stage. There was this one pocket of these four or five white guys in the front. These kids who had never seen no shit like this. And they were like, I think we've just gotten our money's worth. And so the sea of blue, these four white guys are like, yeah, yeah, you and I'm, and I'm like, okay. And then finally, somebody, I, I feel someone tap me on my shoulder and it's the host, this guy, who's like, they just, they just went, they want you to come off stage. And I was like, all right. And I left <laughs> and I'll never forget. Oh, and I flipped them off as I walked off stage. I just did that. That was the second time I'd done that that week. That's, cl that's classy, and, that's classy. And second I time I in four time right. shows. I did it late show Friday too. And uh, <laughs> so never do that. Never do that, young comics. And and I and I remember Larry Bubble Brown was going to do a guest set. And he, <laughs> he bailed. He was going to do a set. Larry was like, I don't want to go on now. <laughs> and that's when I looked at my watch and it had been 11 minutes. And now wow. looking back, I realized it had been less time. I probably did closer to eight or nine minutes because... Uh, I looked at my watch several minutes after I got off stage. And so, and it said 11, I'll never forget that. And uh, yeah, so it felt like an eternity. I felt like I did a full 20 minute set of just eating it up there, but it only oh, been like man. eight. And, uh, and then I walked the sea of, of, you know, cats mean mugging me and like, yeah, motherfucker. Did you, just, like, <laughs> did you leave after the, right after your set? I can't imagine sticking around. They, yeah. Two security guards came and got me. Wow. And they were like, yeah, we're here to get you out of here. Like, and not like kicking you out, but like <laughs> safely. You know what I mean? Like, we're, we're, we're here, two of them. And they took me to this crowd of people. And because um, in the, where the pool tables are, they're just standing around watching. So yeah. these motherfuckers just look at me like, <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, dude. Oh, and the manager was like, I'm really sorry, man. I don't know. And I'm like, it's fine. And he gave me my check. I went and got in my car and drove away laughing immediately. <laughs> oh, wow. Nice. I mean, okay. I, it was, it was terrible, but I was glad I did it. I, from that point on, I was like, I got nothing to prove to myself. Yeah. I don't know how true that was, but, uh, that's how I felt. And, uh, yeah. I mean, that's a great yes. attitude to have afterwards. Like you just have to forget it yeah. right away. Yeah, absolutely. That's great. Yeah. Hey, man, that's probably what that's one of the best uh, bombing stories I've ever heard. I mean, funny, I've had yeah. my own. I had my own, but I, I've mm -hmm. never told the audience, I hate you as much as you hate me, but I'm going to do my time to get paid. I have said, look, I got 20. I've said to the audience, hey, look, I got I got 20 minutes. So I we can make the most of this or we can just sit and look at each other. I'm completely fine with that too, but I'm doing my time. Yeah. But, to, but to be like, I hate you and you hate me, man, that's, that's fine. But I'm going to do my I thing. Mean, and then give them the finger. Oh boy, that's all of the things you should not do. It's so irresponsible. <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's a, I mean, look, let's be honest, man. It was Cat Williams at that time. You're not a good fit for him, right? And his audience. No, not at all. Exactly. So the fact that you even showed up for all four shows, um, I commend you. I do not like the fact that the host was like, it's all, it's already bad enough if you're struggling, but then to have somebody come up on afterwards and compound that with bomb sounds and you want your money. I well, and he, so the set, the last show, I, what I heard him say was, uh, and I hadn't, you know, I used to have a bit about like, oh, I can't fight and, and I, you know, whatever. I'd be the guy in the gang who does the paperwork, you know, that whole bit oh, yeah, about yeah, not yeah, being able to fight all that. Yeah. <clears throat> and, and he, and I hadn't gotten to that bit yet because I had only been on stage for eight or nine minutes. And he comes back on stage and he was like, and I get you have to address it, but he, I forgot what he said, but like it devolved into, y'all want me to go kick his ass? You heard him say he couldn't fight, I'll kick his ass. Oh, and I just remember thinking, what? 
Nice. I haven't even done that bit. <laughs> like that, that was what went to my head. Like, I didn't even get into that bit. What's he talking about? <laughs> what an asshole. <laughs> and the story just keeps getting better. Hey man, yeah. that's, so, that sucks, and man. I, you know, I hate. I couldn't stand that guy for a long time. I mean, I probably, I still can't. But I also, who was it? You don't remember who it was, huh? I know I who did. it is. Oh, who, who? Who is it? You don't want to say? Who I is probably it? told you. I'm not going to tell you on the thing. Okay. He's. I'm sure he's doing very well wherever he is. All right, well, after when this is over, we're going to have to figure it out. I, I got to know right. who it is. All right, well, before um, we let him go, we got to oh, ask man. him. Okay, well, it's, okay, uh, it's better. He's got to work. The man's a working man. But I, yeah. I'm, I'm, I, I got a little bit of time. Okay, but, but, well, whatever. I, I, I got to ask. The dude's won two Emmy Awards. You're the only person we had on here who's won something like that. Like, I mean, that first time had it been fucking crazy for you, huh? It was... Um, yeah, it was, it, it was very stressful. So I'm fortunate enough. I won them both for last week tonight for writing on last week tonight. Um, at the time I, and I was right. I wrote on that show for the first three seasons. We were nominated for the first season and did not win. Oh, that was and John. So John Stewart. John won Daily John, show. John Stewart. I mean, John Oliver. No, John, yeah. Yeah. John Stewart. John Stewart. And, and that, that was, was his last year. year. I'm sorry. Right. I'm sorry. Go ahead. And right. so, so uh, it was an interesting experience to lose, to just, mm -hmm. you know, it was like your first year doing it and then you, you're just happy to be there. But yeah. I do remember, I took my mom and I remember sitting in the audience with her and I was on the edge of, the, of our row and the camera's on you as they announce the categories. And this is, I think th this is the prime time ceremony. We alternate. So one year we go to the prime time, following year they have this at the creative arts ceremony, just so they can get everyone kind of, you know, get everyone in. And, and the creative arts ceremony is usually the more technical awards and things like that. Um, and, but the first year was the prime, it was the one on TV live. And I was just sitting there, the camera's on my face. And then they won. And the camera moves elsewhere. And I remember shortly after that, just thinking, get me out of here. <laughs> I just yeah, wanted, to, yeah. I wanted to go take a walk for a minute. It was just so stressful, but it's still, it was the time of my life. And you forget about it pretty quickly afterwards, at least when it's your first time, even when you lose. Winning the first time, you know, we didn't know. We were like, well, I guess we'll see. We lost last year. Who knows? And to win, I remember two things. They told us at the beginning, when you come up here, don't fall into the orchestra pit. And so <laughs> that was all I could think of as I walked up on the stage. And I, I got up there and I looked down and I was like, oh yeah, that is precarious. Like I realized how I could have easily fallen into the orchestra pit. And then there was a whole big thing about who was gonna make the speech in our group if we won. And he pulled a name out of a hat and selected uh, one of the writers to do it. <clears throat> As we got up on stage, RuPaul and Gloria Steinem announced our category and therefore presented us with the Emmy. And as we walk on stage, I somehow was the first one up there. And Gloria Steinem is holding this thing. And I remember thinking, well, we didn't discuss who holds the Emmy. I don't know why <laughs> I thought that, right. but I was like, you know what? I'll take it. And I just, oh, nice. <laughs> she was looking at me like, take this damn thing. And I was like, okay. And so, yeah, I got to just hold it while Jeff made his speech. And I, I remember Kamau was there. I remember trying to look at him in the audience like, this is crazy. <laughs> and he took a picture of us on the screen of yes. me, so he's not looking at me. He's looking up at the screen. So he has this picture of the screen of me looking at him, like holding this thing, like, what the fuck is happening? <laughs> right. I have it somewhere. But it, yeah, it's, it's an unbelievable moment and it's surreal and it's, um, and then you go back to, you know, your regular life. And I came home a day or two later 
and um, kind of feeling myself. You know, oh, shit, look at me. I got the hand. Came, went back to my New York apartment and uh, thinking, I'm, I'm living the life or whatever the hell I was thinking. And I set the award down in front on the stand in front of my TV right there in my little studio apartment in the East Village. And I was back home maybe 15 minutes when I hear this scratching on my door. There's a, I, live in the, I lived in the first floor front of the building. Ooh, first People's floor. coats or umbrellas would scrape the door occasionally. Well, it wasn't a big deal. But I could hear that it kept happening. And then I heard like a mumbling and I go look out my peephole. There was a couple, this young <laughs> white couple strangling each other in front of my doorway going, Knock it off. No, you cut it out. What are you doing? Cut it. <laughs> Just fighting in front of my and I'm like, and I dialed nine one and then it stopped and they went away. And then they came back 20 minutes later and now we're fighting on the stairs in front of my building. Like, I can't believe I was just trying to hold you and you're trying to choke me out. And then finally, <laughs> the that woman, uh, uh, Kelsey, left. And I know her name is Kelsey because as she left, her boyfriend went, and you can take off that ring, Kelsey, because we're fucking done. And then a door slammed and that was it. And I just sat on the couch and I took that Emmy and I just put it in the case. <laughs> it was like, <laughs> still the Hey, I do oh, remember man, I do crazy. remember uh watching that show live and seeing you up on that stage and holding the Emmy and it was so fucking cool. I was like, look at Kevin Avery. Well, they, they, like, they, it was awesome. Yeah. I don't know if I got to hold it the, when we did so we did it we, we went back the next year and then we were on the live one. So it was like, we lost on the live one. We went to the Creative Arts a second. That was the first time we won. Although they do air that later. And then the following year, we were on the prime time and that was live. And we won and, and we won. And, and I got to go on the, the stage on the live show and I'm looking and there's oh, okay. there's a picture of me walking off stage with John and in between us is Oprah. Wow. in Like a little fuzzy Oprah in her white suit. And that was nuts. That whole thing was nuts. And it was the you know i did a podcast with kamau about denzel washington and one of our guests was sterling k brown and we had not met in person because i was in new york and he did it remotely um but he's a good brother and and i oh and we had connected on on twitter or, or somewhere on social media so we we're familiar with each other a little bit but yeah i didn't know the cat you know and and so we won we eventually get backstage. And again, you get these little lessons that tell you, remember, you still ain't shit. We won, they took us backstage, they ushered, they, you go through a whole maze of things before you get the award and you got to sign for it. And then you got to take pictures and then you got to interview people. They walked, somebody walked us backstage, took a wrong turn and dumped us right back out into the alley with no award. And we were just like, oh, what do we, back, we just go back to our, I remember John Oliver say, literally saying to me, so we just go back to our seats. <laughs> it was like, I, I don't know. And it just was like, wah, wah. Well, eventually we go get the award or uh, get the, the trophy, whatever the hell it's called. And, and I'm walking back with mine to the auditorium. Sterling K. Brown had just won. And he's walking towards us. And we see each other in this hallway. And... And then with the other writers who I think they must have been like, why the hell is this happening? We see each other. He sees me with mine. I see him going to get his. And it was this like, and he just gave me a hug. And it was just, I mean, we just dapped up. And and I felt like, I think this was his second, even it might've been his first. And even though it was his first, I felt like it was a big brother kind of welcoming me into the, I don't know, just had this very brotherly, brotherly like right. quality that that moment. And it felt it was just a cherry on top of the whole thing. And I'm glad we ended up getting ours late because I wouldn't have run into him. Mm -hmm. But it was a very nice moment between this brother and me. And um, yeah, and I'll never forget it. I mean, I don't remember much about being on that stage at the time. I remember running into him in the hallway and him telling me congratulations and giving me a hug and all this shit. And 
walking away like that's crazy that you know he was yeah the whole thing was was kind of a that's awesome hey, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna put a picture up of uh, sterling k right now i just got one on my phone just so the audience will know that dude right oh there, there you go yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> man. That's man where are the emmys now they are uh in my room um in a, they're in a case somewhere okay you don't have them out, out of you can't see them Okay. Oh, no. Why not? I mean, they're, they're hey, hold on. I have a I have a picture of Kevin and I with his Emmy at the first one because you you wanted in New York, you're what? living there, but you came home like you came back oh, out to California. Right. And you had a gathering. We went up. And I was like, "Yo, let's go see the hardware." So we go up to your room and in private, like I held it and looked at it, the whole thing. But when we took the picture, that's right? You know, I was like, "No, I can't hold. I didn't win it, right? Like I refuse. Yeah. Like I'm not that dude that's gonna take a picture in front of somebody's right, right. car like his mom." <laughs> 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 you know what I mean? You know, so I was like, I'm gonna be with the jailhouse house pose. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> so, but I have this picture of you holding yours and me being with you, like, like, yeah. Did like, you hold it? I held it in the. Did you hold like, it? No, not yeah. in the picture. Not in the picture. In the room, I held. Oh, you didn't it. take a like, picture with it? No, I was like, I mean, oh man, this is great. Though it's heavy, right? It's really, it's big. It's this is the bases are big. big definitely big. a murder weapon. Yes. <laughs> heavy base and. And the tip is sharp. The, the sharp. lady she has two wings, and they are yep. sharp as hell. I've I watched two people cut themselves on the dance floor with one of them. Oh wow! <laughs> dan- you got it at the party, yeah. and and somebody, yeah, I, I saw someone cut themselves. Wow. There were there was blood. Wow. <laughs> we were like, well, get out of here for that. Yeah, yeah it's definitely a murder weapon. Definitely a murder <laughs> weapon. Uh, so in the picture that I have, it's it's you holding it because you're the winner, and then me just being with you. It's the same thing. I like I've done that with Mahershala with the Oscars. I'm like in private, yeah. in private, you're like, oh, you know, you do the whole thing. Mm-hmm. But the, like if yo, if we take the pick, I, yo, I didn't win the hardware, bro. I can't yeah, take a picture no. of holding the. That's just that's front. I, I respect that. that. I guess I res- yeah. I don't know. It's just a piece of. It is just a piece of hardware. Yeah, it is it's, ultimately. But it's it, what it represents. I mean, for us, for Sal and I, right? Mm-hmm. You being a guy that we knew in the comedy scene as being a very funny person who's a great writer, uh, you and I doing sketches together and then you and Kamal, you know, having sketches and then Kamal getting a show and and uh, and bringing you along as a writer on that show. Like for us to see you on a regular basis, on a daily basis, sitting in the back room, in the green room and to see your career happen and get to that point, it's just, it's inspiring. Right. Yeah. It's inspiring because this because now it, it makes it real because this is a person that we know, right? Like that we've seen, that we've sat in the back of the room, that we've wrote written jokes with, that we've had writing sessions with, that we've done stuff with. It's like, yo, it makes it seem like, oh, you can be successful in this business. Like you can actually yeah, like move forward and move on. But you know, it's it's just when you see someone that you know do it, it just makes it more realistic. Yeah. I no, I I mean I appreciate the idea that idea, but I do think you got. I mean, I don't know. I feel like coming up through this business, we all you get that taste of of the the reality of success, right. what at whatever level, and the the fact is. You can do that. You can go through this business and never win any kind of award. You can go through this business and win one or or one or two, and, and then never get one again. And that's right. that was your. You could look back on that as your hate it or, or whatever. But what your success is going to be is is solely determined by what you create, what you generate and put out in the world. And I believe you know, and Denzel throws this word around a lot, but your consistency. Right. And, and so it's hard to, because the trap is you can win those awards and then never let go of that moment. Right. And it's stuck in time and be stuck there and then be like, will I ever achieve this again? Will I ever have this moment? And, and it's similar to when you are, <clears throat> When you look at somebody else, another comedian, another actor, another writer, whatever, and you have that jealousy that we all have, we all, you can't help but compare yourself to other comedians, performers, whatever. And you have to, you of course have to shake that off, but it's a similar thing. Looking back on your past success on a past moment and you're essentially being jealous of yourself. 
mm-hmm. when you're like, shit, I'm struggling to write this script or I'm, I'm th- this, this new seven minutes that I've been working on, it's not hitting like I want to or whatever. Remember when I killed that one time at the such and such show? God, what happened to that? You know, you're just being jealous of yourself. And when the truth is you gotta be onto some new shit. I ran yeah. into a friend who interviewed Quincy Jones recently and he told me, and this guy, I hadn't seen him in a long time. Also a guy who'd been on the podcast, but it's like he came out of the heavens to tell me this shit. Ran into him on the street. And he was telling me about talking to Quincy Jones. And he said, Quincy told him, if you ever find yourself when you're in a position of being jealous of somebody, you're thinking too small. He said, you know, I always wanted to be the greatest trumpet player ever, but that's, that was Miles Davis. That was him. I was never going to be that. Um, I had to do my own thing and nobody can out Quincy me. Nobody can do what I can do. And so that's what you have to, that's what you, this business really is trying to force us to do is find the thing that you are, you do and who you are and do that and be that to the nth degree. And that includes, you know, so instead of looking at other people going, well, they got that thing. How did I not get this thing? They do this. How, do, how, how, why is it that I can't do what this person does? You got your own thing and no one will ever be able to tap into a Reggie or a Sal because that's what y'all do. And, or a Kevin, because that's what, what I do. But that includes looking back on your shit and going, why don't I have what I used to have back then? Why, you know, I haven't won an award in a long time or I haven't, I, for whatever reason, I'm not killing like I used to kill or whatever. It's time for you to be on some new shit. Yeah. You, you're thinking too small, you're thinking past. It's time yeah. to, what are you going to do next is the, the most exciting thing about this business. It's the most exciting question you could ask yourself every day. What am I gonna do next? Wow. You, you you have no idea what's around the corner. Right. No idea. Right. Yeah. Right. Anyway, sorry. I didn't preach. No, no that's good, man. Straight, man. That's, that's deep. Good. That's beautiful. That's deep. Because that's... I mean, that's, you know, you and I have talked about this personally, but um, that's kind of where I am comedically, right? It's just, I, not, I'm going to say comedically, I'll just say creatively. Like there's just a part of right. me that feels like, okay, so yeah, and I, you know, on whatever level I am and whatever I've accomplished, mm-hmm. I've had my own personal successes and things have worked out for me in a certain way, but I've always prided myself on keeping my gaze forward versus looking back, right? That's yeah. why, it's, you know, it's, that's what makes it an easier transition from one thing to the next is that when you leave that thing, you're not, you're not spending your time looking back at what it was, but you're looking forward to what right. it is or what it will be. So I feel like I've kind of gotten to a point creatively where I'm like, it's time for me to change my gaze from what it, from here back to there. Cause I've never been one to kind of look there too much, but, mm-hmm. but I'm like, okay, I've, I've looked here for a while and I've gotten complacent, maybe even comfortable yes. to some degree. So now I need to change mm-hmm. my gaze here and that, and figuring out what that next thing is. Right. And so, yeah. so yeah, man, I, that's, that's great. That was great, Kevin. Thank you for sharing that. That was awesome. Yeah, man. man. I mean, I think, I think that can apply to anybody in any walk of life, like whatever it is you're doing, right. Creatively, Absolutely. artistically, engineering, science, math, whatever you want, right? <clears throat> um, yeah, I mean, I think on some level, we're always reinventing ourselves a little bit right, and right. reinventing like, our lives. I mean, overhauling, but just, you know. Mm-hmm. Like if Quincy Jones, well, if Quincy Jones got happy just making the Sanford and Son theme, we would never have had Thriller. So that's good right, advice. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Well, you know, yeah, you know, I can, and I can also say this as a former athlete and basketball player, like a guy who, I mean, I'm not like six, six, I'm not six, seven. Right. And for the position I played, it would, it'd be really easy to compare myself to other people and see where I come up short. Right. right. I played at six, three and a half, six, four, 215 pounds. I'm going up against guys who are six, seven, six, eight, six, 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 six to six, eight, um, mm-hmm. who are long and lean and athletic. And so, because I don't look like that, it's, it would be really easy for me to be like, oh, man, I don't, I don't match up, I don't compare. But personally, I never did that because I was always like, well, my strengths are this. I don't necessarily yeah. have that. And I can't worry about what somebody else does, but I know what I do have, right? And so I have yeah. to maximize what I have and the things that I can do, they can't necessarily do. So right. mm-hmm. it's really like what Quincy said, it's not about trying to compare yourself to be 
being what somebody else is. It's really just being the best you that you can be. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And yeah. that's and that's it. That's it. So yeah, man, and that's beautiful. I'll tell you, you have to learn it early. I mean, or as early as you can, because the most the more successful you become the more you are going to be placed in a position where you are going to be comparing yourself to other people who are way more successful than you are right right and so if you are gonna win if you're winning an award an emmy or whatever if that if that's where, where your career has brought you to you are going to be surrounded at this you're going to go to this function or that you know you go to these little parties or whatever or the ceremony itself and you're going to be surrounded by all these people who are doing you know who are, who are more successful than you are or who right. at least have who have sort of um achieved certain things that maybe you want right you know and you have to be able to just enjoy that and enjoy what you've done as opposed to looking over at like, oh, look at that person, shit. Right. And it's very easy right. to walk away from some of these things feeling bummed out, like, right. I'm not that guy. Well, you know what you're talking about? You know hmm. what you're talking about? You're talking what? about gratitude, being grateful. Yeah. Yeah, being grateful for what you have. A lot of times, and I mean, we've all seen it, but people can't enjoy the moment because they're too busy worrying about what they don't What's have instead of appreciating what they do have, right? right? Yeah. That's, yeah, that's it. It's really about being gracious and being grateful for what you have in that moment and understanding that, yeah, we're all in a different place and we all have different things, yeah. but I mean, um, not the, belittling the your experience. Is, the truth is it hits you after the moment. You can, right. go, to, you can go to a thing and, and be a part of something that you're excited to be a part of and then you can come back home when it's over or whatever and you have this moment of silence where you're suddenly in your head and you're like and this is what i fight with where you're like this is i'm still not where i want to be i'm still not where i'm I having i had the time of my life a day 24 hours ago right. and suddenly i come home and i'm like well now I'm depressed. You know what I'm saying? And it's oh, like, wow. and you have to, and it's like you said, you have to have that gratitude and you have to maintain that you really have to have an understanding. Well, look what I've done. Right. Look yeah, where I right. look what I've already accomplished and look what I'm potentially capable right. of accomplishing. And I mean, what a, a thing that I've always told people about doing is a, a, a little practice I call snapshotting your life. And it is basically this process of taking, I don't know, 10 to 12 moments of mental photographs and you put them in a, in a book too. And it could be an actual photograph. It could be a, a ticket stub from something, a little memory, a memento or something, or it could just be you write a little blurb about it and you stick it in a book. But the idea is that these are, these are 10 or 12 photographs of moments in your life that if you went back in time and showed to your 12 year old self, it would blow his or her mind with no context. Right. No context. Right. Just, right. hey, look at here, Mini Sal. Check, check this. this out, Mini <laughs> Sal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Maybe like, what, what, the, what are you talking about? What the, I can't right. tell you. Anyway, I got to go. You know, and, <laughs> but it's the, the idea is that these are moments that, like you said, you want to hold gratitude for, and that show you, this is where I've already been. Right. This, I did this. Right. Like I have accomplished some of my goals. Like I've done yes. a thing. Right. Reminding yourself. And go and things that I never imagined I would do. Right. So now, right. let what am I going to do tomorrow, next week, next year, then the next five years? They're going to more photographs are coming. Right. But it's just a, it puts it in perspective this i instead of like a woe is me and it's very easy for any of us to get caught up in that it's a very human thing it's yeah but look what i did right right you know um I like I, so this i love i love i love these conversations because it allows me to be able to say because it really comes back to being in the present moment right like yeah. there's a there's a saying that if you look past if you look in the past 
you become depressed. And if you look too far in the future, you become anxious, right? Yeah. So the goal is to stay in the present moment, right? Yeah. If you stay in the present moment, then you can be grateful for what it's for what is actually happening right now. Because this is the only time that truly exists. What's mm -hmm. done is done and what will be is going to be. But right yeah. now is where it's at. And so yeah. whenever you can bring yourself back to the present moment, then you realize, oh, things are happening. Good things are happening. I am yeah. in a place. I have done things, right? Um, Mahersha and I talk about this all the time. And it's one of my favorite stories, just in the sense of like, we talk about being present and understanding and trying to keep your gaze forward. Right. Right. So after he wins the first Oscar, um, you know, I go to his place. We're in L.A. We're hanging out. And I and the Oscars, I'm like, yo, where is it? And it's it's put up high and away like it's out, but it's up high and away. Like you mm -hmm. you literally have to find it. Like, yeah, it's not sitting right there when you walk in the door. Like, <laughs> look at this thing that I've done. Right. 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 And and he and I were talking about I was like, yo, man, I, I love that. Right. I love the idea of of it being, you know, out but away. Right. Just put mm -hmm. away in a certain sense, because. Because in that moment, yes, at that particular time, when that happened, that was great. You, you were recognized by your peers on a high level as having done something in an excellent way, right? Yeah. But that moment is done. That moment is past, mm -hmm. right? So it's about appreciating that moment, being grateful for that moment. But then now it's about the next thing. And the next thing isn't necessarily about trying to recreate that moment because that moment is, is individual to itself. But it's just yeah. about trying to have that same level of excellence going forward, which is really just about trying to be the best version of yourself in any circumstance or whatever it is you're doing. And yeah. awards come or not come, the pride that you have is in your your desire and your ability to, to be the best that you can be and doing the best work you can. Because he and I, we talk about this all the time that it's just always about trying to do good work. Damn the money, damn the awards. It's just about doing something that you love and trying to do it the best that you can do it and being mm -hmm. happy that you're able to do the work. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. That you are working. So. Um, so, yeah, yeah. man, I, I hear you. All right. Yes. So what's what's the next snapshot for Kevin Avery? I mean, I don't. I don't know. What I can was the, tell how about you. This? What was the last snapshot? How about that? What's the last? What was the last snapshot that you. Put I think away? it was yesterday. Oh, there we go. And okay. I think it was. When the no. bee suit arrived. I was against the bee suit. When I wore the bee suit. Um, it was, uh, no, you know what it was? It was, I guess I can say this because someone else announced it. Uh, and it's not that big a deal. But it was, um, I, rec I recorded a couple of characters on Bob's Burgers. Oh, oh shit! All congratulations! Right. I want to check it out. Dude, that's awesome. Uh, I can't tell you anything about it. I don't even know when the episode airs or what. It, I, it it might be the next season or whatever, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't that matter. was that was kind of cool. Yeah, that was, nice. that was a thing, and um, yeah, I mean, I that might be a. I would say that's a snapshot. That's absolutely a snapshot. That's dope, man. Yeah, that's, that's dope. great, man. That's awesome. You know, that is. I, I think mean, I know what the next one will be, but I can't say what it is. Okay, well, but, uh, <laughs> we'll have to come back and talk about it. But, yeah, we're gonna have to have you back. Yeah. Yeah. I don't. Yeah, I don't know what is. You just the whole the idea about it is too is that sometimes it sneaks up on you. You don't know until it you don't happens. Know. And you're like, right. and it's, it's not true. always career shit. It's right. Right. Just personal stuff. Yeah. And um, I'm so I'm glad you I'm glad you pointed that out. I'm so glad you pointed that out. I think that's a very powerful moment, and I don't want to just pass by that. Snapshots, these snapshots in your life don't necessarily have mm -hmm. to be career related. No. It can be personal, right? It could be, it could be the, you know, whatever, it could be whatever's happening in your life, right? Yeah. Like if you have anger control issues and trying to resolve that, if you have emotional, spiritual, physical, mental, whatever it is, mm -hmm. um, even just interpersonal relationships with yourself, with friends, family, <clears throat> whatever the case may be, like having these moments where you can have, where you find that, that, um, that growth and these moments of success, right? right? So um, yeah, so yeah. it doesn't have to be career related. It's just it life a related. Of, it can be a picture of your family. Right, right. Or a 12 year old kid, 12 year old you, a picture of your family, they're going to be, well, hold on a minute. So yeah. this is how it all turns out. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, exactly. It's, exactly. It's about, it's a, you know, it's about all of it. It's really. about all of it. Yeah. I love that. I love that. 
so yeah. all right cool man well, well thanks buddy yeah thanks kevin Thank this you, has man. been awesome man this is this yeah. has been this has been a roller coaster ride of bee suits and i, I learned more about wasps oh, and we came a long way we've come a long we've come way, a long really way. we covered jordan's we get we shared a lot we shared a lot man this has been awesome man yeah um, always good to talk to you guys though this is always fun i love yeah man yeah great man, this scene, is great man. yeah so thank you so much man for taking the time and uh, thank you i will be sending you a text because i want to know who the host was and Tommy T's because I got a story about Tommy T's. Cool. I'll tell you when you if you stop recording or do you go right off? Oh, yeah, no, I'll, yeah, well, we could. Hey, Red, just sign us out right now, okay? All right, all with right. Kevin usually, on, and then usually we'll stop the recording, okay? Usually the guest will like leave, and then Sal and I will just talk about how well, great I'll just it was. I'm gonna walk away. How about that? <laughs> that Kevin Avery, hell of a guy, huh? All right, Red. <laughs> hey, yo, man, Sal, that was that was awesome, man. Uh, Kevin yeah, came through time. big time, man. Gave us a lot of time too. So more costume changes hands. and everything. Dude, I learned more about insects, bees, and wasps. I also learned. Oh wait, hold on. There is. <laughs> y'all, y'all still talking about him? <laughs> yeah, we still talking about you. Uh, we wait, also can learned... I read you something? Sure. I know you're signing off. I just want to, because you mentioned this. I just, just to take it back. I don't. Okay. I know we got it. Okay. But this is. This was. Um, you said something about this being in the moment. Mm. Uh, this is a quote, uh, one of my favorite quotes. Live now, make now always the most precious time. Now will never come again. Exactly. Uh, uh, That's it. Patrick Stewart, as Jean-Luc Picard said that. <laughs> anyway, <I'm> gonna... <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That's funny. I remember uh, seeing awesome. uh, the Star Trek movie with Avery down here in LA or whatever. Came down on one of the visits. You were, was that you oh, too? Nice. Were you with us? It was you, me. I don't think so. I, I feel like no. I did. I know I saw some movie. Avery, all of Moshe. Us movie. Yeah. yeah. All right. No, well, that was it. So. Sign us out. Okay. Um, so I uh, <laughs> want to say thank you to our guest, Kevin Avery, today uh, for coming in and, and uh, sharing sharing his time with us and telling us great stories and uh, you know where he's been, where he's from, and what's going on with him. Uh, Sal and I love doing this. We hope that you enjoy it, too. Hope you enjoy listening and watching. Uh, we're going to keep going. Uh, please stay tuned, subscribe, share with your friends, whatever the case may be. That's Sal Kalani. I'm Reggie Steele, and this has been Spitballer. Peace. <laughs>